Ambassador from Cambodia. Oh yeah. I'm not yet to head the audience. Oh, nice meeting you. So, so you are new? Yeah, new oh, here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Let's meet again. I had a picture with the Prime Minister yesterday. Okay, I will send okay. you. I will send you. Yeah, 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 It's yeah. a good picture. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Very good. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you are. How, how can use, Mr. Sorbonne? Sorbonne. Okay, nice okay. meeting you. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. We've been. Uh, I think very, very excellent cooperation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will discuss more because I also yeah. permanently present this Okay, we'll, we'll okay, catch thank up. You, yeah. thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I propose that we start our today's uh, session, and I, uh, I'm calling the meeting to order. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, we shall now resume our consideration of agenda item two, empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality. General debate on the topic. As you may recall, our discussions under this agenda item started with a high-level panel discussion followed by country st statements by the heads of uh, the delegations on the theme topic. Before we continue with uh, the country statements this morning, it is my great honor to invite the 8th Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Uh, to deliver his keynote address. Mr. Ban Ki-moon, as we know, served as Secretary General of the United Nations from January 2007 to December 2016. And it was under his able leadership that the countries came together in 2015 to agree upon the 2030 Agenda, Sust Agenda for Sustainable Development with its call to leave no one behind. 2015 was a landmark year for uh, this great advocate to sustainable development as his persistent and inspiring leadership also helped to seal the Paris climate deal. Now in his retirement from the UN since 2016, he's tirelessly continuing to his efforts to for sustainable development as the chair of the Council of the Global Green Growth Institute. The uh, co-chair uh, of the uh, Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens in Vienna, along with the former president of Austria, Mr. Heinz Fischer. Mr. Ban is also the distinguished chair, professor, and honorary chairman at the Institute of Global Engagement and em Empowerment at the Yonsei University in Seoul. And most recently, as the chair of the National Council on Climate and air quality of the Republic of Korea. Uh, finally, Mr. Ban also serves as the chair of uh, the Ball Forum for Asia and the chair of the Ethics Commission of the International Olympic Committee. It is indeed an honor to have Mr. Ban among us today, so without further delay, I would give the floor to Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your very warm uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to address uh, this session of ESCAP uh, under the leadership of uh, His Excellency Damdin Chokobatan, a chairperson of this session of ESCAP and Foreign Minister of Mongolia. And Honorable uh, Dr. Armida uh, Salsia Alicia Banner. Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, distinguished 
delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor and privilege to speak to you this morning at the 75th session of the UN ASCAP. As I have been working very closely with all of you in the past during 10 years as UN Secretary General, now standing before you at this time during this very important ESCA meeting, it really makes me feeling back to the United Nations. And I really count on your continuing commitment and leadership in working together uh, to make this better for all. As one of the United Nations' most important and regional bodies, ESCAP's synergistic role in promoting integration in Asia and Pacific is a particularly important uh, to promote multilateral cooperation against expanding nationalism and isolationism. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the Sustainable Development Goals vision for our shared future is to ensure that no one is left behind, regardless of what you are and what you aspire. I firmly believe that our common endeavor to achieve the SDGs can pave the path to equality as well as overcome expanding division. In order to meet this noble aspiration for equality, cooperation, innovation, and engagement by all stakeholders is absolutely essential. And the most important ingredient to ensure higher equality are inclusion and empowerment, which represent the shared theme of this session and the upcoming 2019 high-level political forum in July in New York. Four years since their adoption, the SDGs have made tangible progress, but progress is uneven, depending upon where you are from, depending upon the governments and business communities. Conflict, inequality, and climate change around the world are hindering the SDGs implementation. As such, we need to move forward with a renewed sense of urgency and strong commitment as we have demonstrated at the time of adoption this SDGs. As I look back during the entire history of the United Nations, there was no such time when the United Nations had presented such a most ambitious and far-reaching visions uh, to the world to make this world a better form. And I'm proud to have been part of this with your strong support and leadership. To achieve the SDGs by the 2030 target date, we need on all hands on deck. Everybody must be sure that they are part of this uh, process to harness ownership, participation from all sectors of society. Crucially, we also need increased political will and policy changes to scale up a public investment for people in fields such as health, education, and social protection. In this connection today, I will briefly highlight three critical focus areas where we must redouble our collective efforts to boost inclusion and empowerment for equality. First, education. Along with decent work and income, education can help boost empowerment and inclusion at all levels. One way to help bridge the equality gaps in our societies is to refocus our attention on quality education. Governments need to do more to provide the enabling environment. As the world has become more interconnected, 
on innovative call for transformational changes in, in how we learn, how we think, and how we interact with others has emerged. All people have rights and civic responsibilities that come with being a member of our globalized world. I'm still proud as a second general to have selected Global Citizenship Education, GCED, GCED, as one of the three priority areas of my 2012 Global Education First Initiative. This GEPI initiative has given a lot of hope to many people who otherwise would be wander around on the street and without knowing what, what to do, particularly young girls, young girls. Expanding GSET at the local and regional levels is increasingly essential to ensure that no one is left behind. Indeed, GSET promotes the knowledge, skills, and guiding values required to construct a more inclusive, sustainable, and peaceful world. Never before has there been a greater need to cultivate understanding and tolerance, peace and reconciliation, and sustainable and inclusive futures. The rising threats of nationalism, xenophobia, climate change, and other challenges give urgency uh, to this work. In this regard, the first thing after my retirement from the United Nations in 2017, I launched the Bandiaman Center for Global Citizens in Vienna, Austria, to continue my commitment and help forge a brighter, more inclusive, and more empowering future for the next generation. As we are living in this small world with a transformative development of science and technology, we are effectively, we have become a global citizen, regardless of where you are. The boundaries, national boundaries, do not have much meaning at this time. We are just a part of this global, globalized world. Second, policymakers must do more to build inclusive societies to expand equality. Investing in inclusive planning in our cities represents an important opportunity for our sustainable future. According to UN projections, 68% of the global population will live somewhere in the cities by the year 2050. This is part of an unparalleled global transition that is bringing in seismic challenges to our economies and relationship. However, this rapid urbanization can offer us new opportunities to achieve sustainable development, to tackle inequality, and to combat a climate change. Sustainable urbanization can help lift residents out of poverty, enhance social inclusion, and expand equality. It can drive innovation and opportunity. It can improve public health. I also believe that the healthy atmospheric environment is a prerequisite to ensuring inclusiveness and equality in the Asia-Pacific region. According to the WHO, air pollution is believed to be accountable for 7 million deaths per year globally. 92% of Asia and the Pacific's population, about 4 billion, are exposed to levels of air pollution. Families in developing countries are more dependent on burning wood, coal, and kerosene oil 
for cooking and heating, making them more exposed and vulnerable to air pollution. Air pollution itself is a global and regional challenge. We share the same atmosphere, and we must share the responsibility to address air pollution, including micro dust, fine dust, or PM 2.5. Namely, we are one respiratory uh, community. No country alone can fully tackle the root causes of air pollution by itself. Thus, our actions must transcend all frontiers. While serving at the United Nations, with the member, all the member states, as a part of SDGs, we invested, we worked very hard to provide safe drinking water to all the people still are lacking from safe drinking water. But when it comes to water and air, there's no choice for us. Water, you can immediately understand that this water is not good. Then you can buy water, safe drinking water. It, it is what the most people do. But there is no choice when it comes to air. You have to breathe whatever your status may be, however rich you may be. We breathe same air. That's where we need to do much more to provide safe air, clean air. Against this backdrop, the National Council on Climate and Air Quality was launched on April 29th of this year in Korea to initiate in-depth discussion among all stakeholders to jointly develop a comprehensive solution to tackle particular matter uh, air pollution in Korea. I accepted the chairmanship of this council because I believe that combating air pollution is an essential element to improve the quality of life and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Not only for Korean people, but for all. Air pollution is also closely linked to climate change. The main driver of climate change is a fossil fuel combustion, which is also a major contributor uh, to air pollution. Therefore, mitigating air pollution will offer a win-win strategy for both climate and health simultaneously. Recently, the chairman's statement of the OECD Ministerial Council meeting was adopted to encourage further international cooperation on transboundary air pollution. I welcome the OECD's efforts and call upon all ESCOM members to cooperate in adopting the draft resolution to, I quote, strengthen regional cooperation to tackle air pollution challenges in Asia and the Pacific, unquote, during this session. I count on your strong leadership to make sure that the people in Asia and Pacific and all around the people can really maintain healthy life breathing clean air, quality air. We need to elevate solidarity among all international stakeholders and immediately take necessary steps to combat air pollution to ensure sustainable and an inclusive development for Third, empowering women and girls and youth and promoting gender equality is essential to spur equality and achieve the SDGs. We must strengthen our efforts to remove the barriers of gender equality at the local, national, regional, and international levels. This is the area and this agenda on which I have paid a lot of commitment and leadership role 
in making sure that world's leaders and world's leaders pay attention in enhancing and empowering women and youth. Half of the global population, in fact more, more of the global population are women. So it is logically sensible, right, and politically right to give at least equal opportunity to women, if not more. Combining youth, the global population, the youth, the number of global population of youth under the age of 24, that takes 25% of this population. Then combining women, half of the population, and 25% of youth, that comes 75% of global population, either women and young people. Therefore, it is only, only natural that we should do much more to empower women, girls, and young people all together. If we continue to hold back half of the world's populations, women, and 25% of the young people, it's simply impossible to build equal societies. Therefore, we must do much more to bolster the inclusion and empowerment of all women and youth as well. We must remember that only through women's full and equal participation in all areas of public and private life can we holistically address the numerous global challenges we face today. Mr. Chairman and Madam Executive Secretary, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Asia and Pacific vision represents the vanguard of global efforts to build a sustainable future. This vision has limitless potential in terms of its economic, cultural, and innovative vibrancy. However, to ascend to this potential, leaders must do much more to close the gaps and widen equality uh, through inclusion and empowerment for all. We must remember that in our increasingly interconnected world, global challenges inherently require global solution. There is not a single country or single individual, however powerful, however resourceful one may be, can address all these global challenges. We have to work together. Unless we work together, we have to regret the what you are doing for succeeding a generation. And visual cooperation, capacity building, and technical assistance remains critical to such global efforts. We can create the better future we want. This is a main philosophical theme. What, we, what kind of world do we want? And the world, the better for all. These are something which the world leaders just agreed upon when they adopted Sustainable Development Goals in September 2015. And that is anchored in inclusion, empowerment, and sustainability for all people and for our planet. I count on your strong commitment and leadership with the global citizenship. And ladies and gentlemen, let us work together uh, to make this world a better for all. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and we really admire your great global leadership. And I remember the days when you were Minister of Foreign Affairs and we organized the visit of uh, President, late President Nam Hyun to Mongolia. And also, as your, uh, when you were serving as Secretary General of the UN, as the Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mongolia, I was very closely cooperating with you. And your leadership in that, uh, 
you know, promoting women's rights really made you a great uh, leader in the eyes of, made you a great leader in the eyes of my wife, which makes me unconditionally your great supporter right away. So I will keep uh, uh, supporting you. And indeed, uh, your emphasis on education and global education, global approach on education is really um, absolutely paramount because nothing empowers people as education. And 2,000 years back, Aristotle used to say that the difference between educated and, ad and uneducated is as between the living and dead. So education was always very important tool for making people, uh, you know, for empowering people. Thank you, sir. Let's give another round of applause. Now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Faima Latoa Kolotita Stowers Akao, Minister of Health of Samoa. The floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is an honor to present Samuel's statement on the occasion of the 75th ESCAP Commission, the thematic focus of which is to consider ways by which we can close the gap between the disadvantaged and advantaged and ensure that equality is realized. The question is, how has multilateralism assisted to close the gap so that no one is left behind? Samoa reaffirms its commitment to promote and uphold equality, including of opportunities through the empowerment of all vulnerable groups, including women, youth, and persons with disabilities, and that they are placed at the center of all national policy making and programming. Samoa has ratified five of the nine core human rights conventions. At the presentation of its voluntary National Review Report in 2016, Samoa made an undertaking to take a human rights approach to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda. With the alignment of the Agenda 2030, Samoa Pathway, Paris Agreement, Sendai Framework for Disaster Re Risk Reduction, and Pacific Framework for Regionalism to our National Development Strategy. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provides a perfect frame for understanding how the pursuit of peace and security development and human rights are all intimately related. No commitment to inclusion would be complete without concerted effort to further empower women and engage with youth. Much can also be gained through empowering, supporting and engaging global youth. Some of the obstacles that still stand in the way of genuine inclusion of these critical stakeholders could be addressed by looking at increases and the quality of funding. Predictability and flexibility of funding are key to making programs efficient and sustainable. Increased awareness of violence against women, growing support for women's empowerment, and more understanding about the links between inclusivity and development offer a unique opportunity to accelerate action toward bringing more women into the mainstream of decision making and sustaining peace at all levels. There is a need to translate normative frameworks, both literally and culturally, through the translation of the policies and practices of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda into accessible resources in many languages that would allow them to reach a broader audience further by interpreting the agenda according to local customs or through the lens of religious norms, and community leaders can better harness the potential of women, youth, people with disability in their work for progressive, progressive change. Mr. Chairman, Samoa's National Policy for Gender 2016-2020 acknowledges that gender equality and equity are requisites to achieving the goals for the strategy for the development of Samoa and the goals and aspirations of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. The Samoa Pathway is the blueprint for sustainable development among small island developing states. 
specific emphasis is on inclusive and equitable growth, reducing inequalities, promoting gender equality, and fostering equitable social development and inclusion. Similarly, the framework for Pacific regionalism places emphasis on inclusiveness, effective prioritization, and the importance of a strengthened collective approach towards development. Chairperson, the Samoan government, with the help of its bilateral and multilateral development partners, has looked at a series of mechanisms to reduce the economic vulnerability of women, young people, and people with disability through support of TVET learning opportunities, entrepreneurship, and pathways to jobs. The Samoa Qualifications Authority has developed competency-based qualifications for non-formal learning enabling early school leavers to receive a qualification and obtain better employment prospects. The Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Labor has also established a job seekers tool through its website for unemployed persons to register and outline their skills for easy access by employers seeking workers. Under the leadership of our Ministry of Education, there has been an expansion of inclusive education practices in schools across Samoa. This has seen a steady increase of children with disabilities enrolling in regular schools, which in turn are supported with a competent workforce and additional resources. Under bilateral trade agreements, as well as bilateral development cooperation, labor mobility programs have become a win-win for partner countries, such as Australia and New Zealand, and sending countries like Samoa. A staged expansion across the Pacific will help fill labor shortages in most countries, in host countries, and provide additional opportunities for Samoan workers to earn income and develop skills in fields beyond agriculture. More and more women are being selected for such schemes. Similarly, Samoa is happy to be part of the new initiative to advance Time. women's entrepreneurship in Asia-Pacific by ESCAP with financial support from Global Affairs Canada. Women who establish businesses have the potential to achieve economic independence, over, overcome extreme poverty and improve the well-being of their families and communities. The Samoa Women Shaping Development Program, funded by the Government of Australia, continues to provide entrepreneurial business management trainings delivered through a local partner as well as access to start-up grants to establish micro-businesses. In February this year, the EU-UN Spotlight Initiative for the Pacific was launched in Apia to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls. The initiative initiative represents an unprecedented global effort to invest in gender equality and women's empowerment as a recognition, as, as a precondition and driver for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. In conclusion, Chairperson, while there is still more work to be done, Samoa remains committed to exploring more effective, concrete and reliable approaches on the ground with key partners and stakeholders. We must work collaboratively in partnership with the UN community as well as capitalize on the opportunities presented by the existing ESCAP platforms and the overall multilateral framework. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, well, indeed, uh, Samoa's uh, comprehensive approach is uh, also proposing interesting, you know, experiences for us to look at, especially this uh, easy access for approach on ensuring e easy access for employers to the competent workforce is something that we're also in Mongolia trying to organize because without the help of uh, uh, the uh, government authorities at times, uh, there is this mismatch and it's causing some disruption as well and especially women's education, as you, uh, Minister, said, it really ensures the independence of women and it really helps the economic growth. Now, at this moment, I would like to turn over the proceedings to His Excellency Mr. Lee Tuch. Uh, Senior Minister from uh, Cambodia and Vice Chair of the Commission to conduct the meeting from this point onwards because I have uh, uh, 
couple of meetings uh, are waiting ahead. And at this moment, I really also would like to express my gratitude to all of you and say a few words of my gratitude in uh, Thai as well, because we're doing this conference in Thailand. ผมอยากจะขอบคุณผู้ที่ทำประชุมครั้งนี้สำหรับการเวทผมเป็นประธานสมาชิกมหาสมาชิกองค์การเอสคาปนี้และผมอยากจะขอบคุณรัฐบา
Sri Lanka has achieved universal coverage in the supply of electricity and now focusing on diversifying our energy sources particularly to enable higher electrical electricity production from renewable sources, safe water for drinking and enhanced sanitation facilities for all are also nearing achievement. The impacts of climate change are major obstacles for sustained economy. Growth and development, therefore, the government has incorporated disaster risk reduction approach into the country's development plan. While focusing to develop adaptive social protection schemes, in addition, fiscal measures, especially in terms of taxation, were introduced to promote full efficient vehicles in keeping with Euro 4 standards. Mr. Chair, Sri Lanka had made significant steps towards lifting people out of poverty further. The theme of budget 2019 was empowering the people and nurturing the poor. Additionally, while facilitating investment in large-scale industries. Enterprise Sri Lanka, a loan scheme, is in progress to develop small and medium entrepreneurs island-wide island based on available resources and capability of the people. Having acknowledged the necessity to bridge the income inequality, the government has announced its intention to imp improve the ratio of direct indirect taxes to 40 60 level from the existing level of appro appro approximately uh, 1684 in 2017 the government is also in the process of introducing new technologies to the management of court system the enforcement of existing legislation to avoid uh, violence against women, girls, and children has been further strengthened. In addition, all forms of child labor have been uh, prohibited and child rights are uh, well protected by law. Excellency, excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the different goals and targets will, however, present degrees of challenge and uh, ambition. To achieve them at a global level requires a truly supportive economic environment, enhanced investment flows, a fair and supportive multilateral trade regime for different countries depending on their present state of development and other national circumstances. In this context, Sri Lanka look forward to further cooperating with SCAP in carrying out the government visions in achieving the 2030 agenda to its fullest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your statement. We wish you all the best for the success of your economic and social programs and uh, goals for betterment and improvement of your people's uh, livelihoods. At the same time, so on behalf of our colleagues uh, who are here, I would like to say how much we were saddened by the uh, recent bombings, uh, daily bombings in Sri Lanka. I would like to uh, uh, send our sympathy to all those uh, affected by the tragedies. Thank you very much. The next, I would like to invite Secretary for Foreign Affairs from uh, Tonga, uh, Mr. Mahe Tempunha, to deliver his statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, Madam Under Secretary General and then Executive Secretary of the United Nations, ESCAP, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the given government and people of the Kingdom of Tonga, I warmly congratulate you on your election as chairman of this session, and we assure you of the full support of the Tongan delegation throughout your distinguished chairmanship. 
The Tongan delegation also conveys its sincere gratitude to the government of the Kingdom of Thailand and the UN Discap for organizing and hosting this important 75th session. The Kingdom of Tonga aligns itself with the statement delivered yesterday by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Nauru and Chair of the Pacific Islands Forum Group. We welcome the central and timely theme of empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality, which builds upon Tonga's focus when it presents the progress on the status of its Sustainable Development Goals at the 2019 High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development in July this year under the auspices of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Indeed, included in the key messages for six SDGs to be reported in Tonga's 2019 VNR is SDG 8, to strengthen sustainable economic growth through use of relevant trade tools and employment opportunities for our people. We will continue to implement relevant structural reforms and further develop productive sectors. We will also promote decent work, including those in the informal sector, and public-private partnerships for improved service delivery. Furthermore, Tonga recognized the need for equal opportunities for all, in particular, vulnerable and marginalized groups, including access to employment, political leadership, and social services. This is underpinned by our commitment for all men, women, and children to live in an environment free from all forms of violence and exploitation. Mr. Chairman, while we value transforming our world and our own countries to achieve the 2030 Agenda, we also appreciate that it rests upon leadership, innovation and strategic collaborations at the local and national levels. Therefore, with adherence to its long-standing Christian belief in cultural and traditional values and sustainable development, the presentation of Tonga's Voluntary National Review is an embraced opportunity to share its collective efforts in terms of the National Development Agenda and related SDG implementation. Essentially, it highlights the improved coordination amongst all stakeholders towards implementation while identifying key issues, selected priority programs, and updates and priorities contained in the Tonga Strategic Development Framework 2, 2015 to 2025. We also wish to acknowledge with much appreciation the assistance and support provided by UNDESA, UNDESCAP, and related UN agencies to ensure the Tonga's VNR process has progressed well with the recent submission of its final VNR key messages to the United Nations in New York. We convey sincere best wishes to all delegations for fruitful and successful deliberations and outcome during this 75th session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your statements, Mr. Secretary. I would like to say how much we appreciate uh, your uh, commitments to uh, improve your uh, country's uh, social uh, uh, conditions uh, as CAP stand with Tango to Tanga to uh, improve, uh, to build a better future for, for the people of uh, Tanga. My speakers would like to uh, invite uh, Special Foreign Secretary from Pakistan, Mr. Amitja Ahmed, to deliver his country statement. You had the floor. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Pakistan delegation, I would like to commend Executive Secretary for her visionary stewardship of our collective work at, here at ESCAP. Let me also appreciate the excellent work done by ESCAP Secretariat for successful organization of the Commission session. Mr. Chair, 74 years have passed since the people of the United Nations underlined their determination in the United Nations Charter to affirm faith in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small 
and to promote social progress and better standard of life in lots of freedom. However, despite rapid economic growth, development and technological innovations over the last seven decades, millions of people across the globe are still tiling in poverty. Social, economic and gender inequalities abound. Marginalized and disadvantaged groups, including women, disabled and elderly, remain the subaltern part of societies. In this backdrop, the theme of this session, empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality, is most timely and appropriate, also consistent with the forthcoming global discussions in New York. My delegation welcomes the theme study, Closing the Gap, Empowerment and Inclusion in Asia and Pacific. The report highly identify, uh, rightly identifies and explores the linkages between and among sustainable development, poverty, empowerment, equality, and inclusiveness in the Asia-Pacific region. We appreciate the effort that have gone in to produce this excellent document. Mr. Chair, the theme study presents a somber picture of prevalent socioeconomic realities in the Asia-Pacific region. Despite important gains made in lifting people out of poverty, inclusive and equi equitable development is impeded by uh, unequal opportunities based on gender, education, physical status, and geographical location. Adoption of SDGs rekindle the hope of achieving a more equitable world. These goals carry forward the unfinished agenda of M MDGs and apart from being more holistic, place special emphasis on social and economic inclusion. Whereas the call to have no one behind offer glimmering optimism, it also presents daunting challenges. These challenges emanate from the structural impediment within societies as well as risks posed by regional and international dynamics. Mr. Chair, Pakistan has signed SDGs with its national uh, policies, plans, and the long-term development framework, Vision 2025. Primary focus of the government of Prime Minister Imran Khan is on development, social justice, empowerment, and inclusion. A number of steps have been taken to foster social and financial inclusion, ensuring equal opportunities for the marginalized and disempowered provision of education opportunities and access to livelihood and social safety nets. Through laws, policies, and strategies, concerted efforts are being made at national and provincial level to address gender inequality and foster women economic empowerment and entrepreneurship. The government is committed to boosting trade, promote economic growth, and safeguard a decent standard of living for all. More jobs are to be created through structural transformation, industry reorientation, skills building of youth, and focus on SMEs, IT, tourism, and agriculture sectors, as well as major infrastructure programs. It's a priority of government to ensure universal social protection and financial inclusion for all. A social protection and poverty alleviation division has been established for aligning and integrating various poverty alleviation and social uh, protection initiatives. BMZ Income Support Program remains the flagship initiative with the vision to elevate the status of, status of marginalized and underprivileged section of society, especially women, through the establishment of comprehensive social protection net. The government has also recently launched a targeted poverty alleviation program called Ehsan Our Feeling. The Prime Minister Youth Program entails a broad canvas of schemes aimed at en enabling youth and underprivileged to access up employment opportunities through skill development, higher education, and information technology. More resources are being allocated to improve access equity and quality of basic and college education. Investment is being made in physical infrastructure, upgradation of education institution, and opening of new facilities, especially for technical and vocational education. 
uh, in China Pakistan economic corridor we are entering the next stage with greater emphasis on social economic uplift uplift poverty alleviation agriculture cooperation and industrial development through these people centric policies Pakistan has made considerable progress in implementing the 2030 development agenda especially regarding the inclusion and empowerment of women a fact also documented in the theme study we are cognizant that many challenges remain which need more attention we are committed to overcome them and implement the 2030 development agenda Mr. Chair, distinguished guests, the message from this session is loud and clear. We must act and act together. Development does not happen in silos. We all have to play our part and collaborate to create synergies. SCAP is an excellent platform for policy dialogue, sharing of experiences and best practices, and consolidating our efforts to advance our shared objectives. Pakistan will continue to support ISCAP and work together with all members to build an inclusive, resilient and sustainable future for Asia and Pacific. I thank you all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Special Secretary, for your statement. Um, ISCAP would like to recognize your uh, efforts on uh, your national social programs and ESCAP will continue in return uh, to work with uh, Pakistan. Yeah, thank you very much again for your statement. Next speaker, I would like to invite uh, our colleague from ASEAN member states uh, from Brunei Jerusalem, uh, Mr. Panigran Halat. Madam, yes, you have the floor. Thank you. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning. Honorable Chairman, Excellencies, Madam Sec Executive Secretary of the United Nations Escape, Distinguished Delegates, uh, del Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of Brunei Delegation, uh, I will begin with expressing sincere gratitude to the United Nations Escape and the Royal Thai Government for the warm welcome and hospitality hospitality accorded to us during this commission. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Brunei Salam supports the convergence of this year's theme for the Commission and Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development with a the theme for the 2019 High Level Political Forum. Empowerment and inclusion are important tools in tackling inequality by providing access to basic opportunities such as education, health, or sustainable income, people in situations where they are marginalized or face high income inequality or poverty are able to progress to better circumstances. They are able to earn an income that is sustainable and sufficient to provide for themselves and in turn are empowered to improve the, their circumstances. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, in our journey towards achieving the national vision, Wasan Brunei 2035, Brunei Dosalam focuses on strategies and policies that help us achieve the three goals, namely having an educated, highly skilled and accomplished people, high quality of life and a dynamic and sustainable economy. As was highlighted during last year's session, inequality and access to opportunities restricts social mobility. Thus, Brunei Salam continues to place great emphasis on ensuring policies are inclusive, such as that its citizens' well-being, health and education are taken care of and remain at high level. Universal health coverage is at the cornerstone of Brunei Salam's health policies where we ensure that all levels of society have the same access to quality health services anytime and anywhere, without being financially burdened. Brunei Salam recently launched a national mental health line due to increasing awareness regarding mental health. Brunei's life expectancy at birth of 77.8 years exceeds the average life expectancy at birth of the global population in 2016. 
There are currently 16 doctors per 10,000 population. Our immunization coverage has consistently remained above 95% for all vaccinations in a program and meets targets set by the World Health Organization. Brunei Darussalam continues to invest in the physical and mental health of its citizens, which are all vital to a country's development. Furthermore, Brunei Darussalam ensures universal access to education, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or social economic background. The Miftahul Majah Kitu Success Scheme, administered by the Ministry of Education, provides financial assistance to students from low-income backgrounds so that the basic needs are met. These, among others, allow those from disadvantaged backgrounds to climb up the so-called socio-economic ladder. Distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, based on the 2017 Labour Force Survey, Brunei Darussalam's unemployment rate is at 9.3%. The unemployment rate for youth is 28.9%. With this situation in mind, Brunei Darussalam is actively implementing initiatives and programs to reduce the unemployment rate, particularly among the youth. One such in initiative is in driving the growth of small and medium enterprises, SMEs, which play an important role not just for economic development but also in job creation, thus providing income and alleviating poverty. In ASEAN member states, SMEs account for between 51.7% to 97.2% of total employment. In this regard, Brunei Darussalam embraces a whole-of-nation approach in compensating initiatives to drive youth entrepreneurship in the country. Brunei Darussalam Enterprise, there, is the national SME body and has the primary goal of supporting the growth of SMEs in Brunei. There has implemented various programs and initiatives such as through provision of capital capacity building programs, securing funding by venture capitalists, provision of industrial land and complexes, as well as growth outside of Brunei. These efforts have resulted in an increase in the number of micro, small and medium enterprises in the non-oil and gas sector by 8% in 2017. The National Master Plan and the National Action Plan under the National Council on Social Issues, spearheaded by the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports, MCYS, addresses the issue of rising unemployment and social problems in the country. In its efforts to address unemployment among the able-bodied and able-to-work recipients of the monthly welfare system from MCYS, the Ministry focuses on providing programs that increase employability and provide entrepreneurship skills to give welfare recipients opportunities to be independent and escape poverty. For example, the Ministry has implemented two pilot projects that have successfully provided employment to welfare system recipients as well as dependents of the monthly welfare system recipients. Other programs include those where welfare recipients are given opportunities to study in vocational and technical centers where they are able to learn technical skills. Ad additionally, the Ministry of Rural Just Affairs conducts various, various programs that focus on entrepreneurship to empower the poor and destitute who qualify to receive arms. For example, it recently organized a 15-month program that provided training in both conventional and agribusiness concepts to arms recipients who possess the drive to change their, their lives. Post-program system in the form of advice and assistance in securing items such as fertilizer and equipment is also provided. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, recognizing the increasing need to, uh, to address inequality, ESCAP continues to play an important role towards empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality to encourage empowerment and equal access to opportunities for greater social mobility and thus reduce inequality and address Poverty. As such, Brunei Darussalam joins the global community in addressing rising inequalities in income, access, opportunities, and resources. We fully support the Commission's continuous hard effort in ensuring the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and we commend the Commission's ongoing endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh
Madam Deputy Dependent Secretary of the Plum Source Office of Brunei, we thank you for your statement. And you and SCAP continue to support to support you to carry out His Majesty national programs for uh, betterment of uh, uh, your people. My speakers would like to invite your Excellency, Madam Ambassador from uh, Turkey, Madam Evident, to deliver her statement. Thank you. You had the floor. Excellency, Chair of the 75th Session of the UNSCAP, Honorable Ministers, um, Ambassadors, uh, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, um, good morning. At the outset, I'd like to express my delegation's sincere thanks to the Secretariat for organizing this important event with a very um, significant theme for all. I'd also like to extend our thanks to the um, government of the Kingdom of Thailand for hosting the event. And um, as it's the first time I'm taking the floor, I'd like to join in um, all those um, who expressed their condolences on the loss of General Prem Tinsul Nanda, President of the Privy Council. Distinguished guests, inequality remains one of the greatest challenges facing not only developing countries, but also those that are relatively better off. Middle-income nations are grappling with increasing inequality and a growing gap in the standard of living between the poor and the wealthy. Although half of the world's economies experienced accelerated growth in 2017 and 2018, sustainability of global economic growth in the face of rising financial, social, and environmental challenges is questionable. Advancements have been uneven across regions, between the sexes, among the people of different ages, wealth, and locales, including urban and rural dwellers. More than half the world's population has no access to social protection, perpetuating high levels of subsistence activities. These imbalances push the targets of eradicating poverty and creating decent jobs for all further from reach. Weak per capita income growth in regions where poverty levels and inequality remain high acts as a severe impediment to social development. Despite substantial progress over the last two decades, more than 700 million people remain below the extreme poverty line, of which more than half are in Africa. So we also need a paradigm shift from the do no harm concept towards more proactive, complex, and integrated solutions to address inequality. I'd like to touch now on the Turkish experience in providing equality and inclusive development for all, which has been put forward as a model in many platforms. The concept of sustainable development has been at the heart of Turkey's development policies. The UN 2030 agenda, which introduced a far-reaching plan of action, has been integrated into our development plans and sectoral strategies and are supported at the presidential level. We've put into place several strategies in mobilizing several sectors, including the private sector, for financing of development. Turkey will present its second voluntary national review at the HLPF in July. In an effort to bring a holistic and comprehensive approach to, to the process, almost 3,000 people and institutions were directly involved in the preparations. As the leading principle of the 2030 agenda, leaving no one behind, is given a separate chapter in the VNR, solely dedicated for the policies and practices towards vulnerable groups such as women, children, disabled people, youth, elderly, and the migrants. Turkey's policies towards reducing inequality within and among countries are holistically integrated across several areas, ranging from basic constitutional rights to income distribution, and from social security policies to fiscal regulations. Among those regulations are the strengthening of vulnerable groups through various policy instruments, primarily social transfers, reducing inter-regional inter development differences, tax policies in favor of lower income groups, increasing the amount and effectiveness of social assistance, increasing women's labor force participation, and sound measures against informal employment. Turkey eradicated absolute poverty by means of policies that strengthen macroeconomic stability, economic growth, and social transfers. There's also been a significant progress in reducing the share of informal workers in total employment. The wage subsidies, especially <coughs> subsidies through tax and social security premium incentives, especially for women, young people, and minimum wage employees increase the income of wage earners. The Occupational Health and Safety Law of 2012 improved the rights, payments, and conditions of workers. The law on trade unions enacted the same year extended the union rights. Moreover, the pro-poor policies pursued in sectors such as employment, social security, education, health, and housing have significantly contributed to the eradication of poverty. Distinguished guests, the other policies and programs that help the eradication of poverty in Turkey are the diversification of and increase in the social assistance programs, 
and the increase of girls and disabled persons' access to education. At the local level, we've established gender equality units in municipalities and we're preparing local equality action plans. Women's participation in the labor force is supported by various policies, such as the right to part-time work for six years after the birth of child and 60 days of income support. The institutions that implement social assistance and support programs have been incorporated into a single entity under the Ministry of Labor, Social Services, to deliver a coordinated and focused action. In order to raise the living standards of the poor and eradicate poverty, we put into place several programs on basic needs, education, and family. It's worth noting that education, health assistance programs were prioritized to reduce intergenerational poverty. In order to eliminate inter-regional inequality, regional development agencies support and put into place several programs in a wide range of areas. These agencies also work in close cooperation with the private sector. The climate change strategy for 2010 to 2023 puts forward important measures to reduce the risks of environmental disasters on vulnerable groups. In this context, strategy, strategies and implementation plans have been developed to increase the resilience of the urban vulnerable to climatic risks. In order to help eradicating poverty among countries, Turkey has increased its official development assistance to 8.1 billion US dollars in 2017. And finally, the policies on migrants, asylum seekers, and people under temporary protection are developed with a sustainable development perspective. To date, Turkey has spent more than 37 billion US dollars from its own resources for the Syrians in the country. Those people under temporary protection in Turkey are provided with equal education, health, and humanitarian services, granted employment permits to prevent informal sector employment. Turkey firmly supports the UN 2030 agenda and remains, uh, remains ready to maintain its efforts to reduce inequality. I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, thank you for your statement. Uh, you, you have kept recognized the progress and uh, achievements of your country, and has kept continue to uh, extend its cooperation to, to Turkey. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, for your statement once again. Right, next speaker is uh, from Myanmar. I'd like to invite your Excellency's Ambassador, uh, uh, Min Tan, uh, to deliver his uh, country statement. Please, you have the floor, sir. Uh, we met this morning uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you, your Excellency. Please go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to deliver a statement at this auspicious occasion of the 75th and session of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific on the behalf of the government of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. First of all, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the government of the Kingdom of Thailand and the Secretariat of the ESCAP and its entire staff for excellence preparations and arrangements for the meetings and hospitality provided to the participants. I would like to also to take this opportunity to congratulate His Excellency Mr. Damjan Sobata, incoming chair and its teams for being elected to lead this session. I'm honored to share through the country statement what the government of Myanmar is implementing and undertaking to fulfill the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. With the goal of the UN 2030 agenda, no one leaves behind and all inclusiveness, Myanmar's sustainable development plan, MSDP, was launched in August 2018. The MSDP is structured around three pillars, five goals, 28 strategies, and 251 action plans. Also are firmly aligned with the SDGs, various regional, global commitments, and 12 points economic policy of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. To ensure exclusive and equality, we believe that it is important to effectively use of aid for the benefits of all, including vulnerable and marginalized groups. In this regard, the government is has established the Development Assistant Coordination Unit, TACU, in 2016 as a high-level platform for coordination, policy development, and strategic decision-making. 
in order to make use of eight projects for the development of a country. The DAGRI is now the pick of government body for decisions on eight and eight policy, which is chaired by the State Councillor Doa San Suu Kyi. As a result, Development Assistant Policy DAB was adopted in February 2018. It is a tool which will make the better and easier process than before for the flow of the International Development Assistant to Myanmar. A new set of sector coordination groups have been established to facilitate effective and coordinated development assistance within designated sectors. I'm glad to inform you that several projects have been implemented for economic and social development in Myanmar. The development projects for maternal, newborn child health, communicable diseases, and health systems strengthening are being implemented with the cooperation of the Ministry of Health and Sports and UNOPS under the three MDG funds. To improve the standard of living of the rural people, to create jobs and to generate income, the development projects in the areas of livelihood, skill development, agriculture, financial inclusion, migrations and nutrition have been conducted in collaboration with the line ministries. Current UNDP country programs 2018-2022 is being undertaken the areas of sustainable peace and effective governance and inclusive resilience and sustainable growth and development. Myanmar needs to address structural adjustment in various sectors, including the agricultural sector to remain competitive. Thus, strategy and action plans are formulated in Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan. Poverty reductions and human resources development, which concludes which includes people's empowerment, are given priorities of the state, and as a result, the poverty trend is declined. Myanmar has been making significant economic reforms by adopting 12 points economic policy, with the purpose of achieving sustainable development to accelerate economic development at the macro level, which is in need for poverty reduction. To end the poverty of a country, it is important to create better life for each poor household. In conclusion, with the views of full, effective and timely implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Myanmar would like to reaffirm its commitment to work closely with the international community through strengthening partnership. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you for your statement. I thank you very much. Uh, uh, we wish you uh, success uh, and we would like to say how much we uh, uh, would like to recognize your 221 action plans. We wish you success uh, on this and from Cambodia would like to say how much we appreciate the visit, the state visits of uh, Madame Ong An Suu Kyi in Cambodia this month. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for your statement. Next speaker, I'd like to invite Ambassador from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea uh, to deliver his country statement. Your Ambassador, please. Distinguished Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the DPRK delegation, I congratulate Mr. Damdin Chokwatar on your election as the chair of the current session. And I hope this session will bear fruitful result under your seasoned leadership. At the same time, I express my appreciation to Her Excellency Armida Salsiah Alice Zawana, Executive Secretary of UNSCOP and the Secretariat for the efforts made for the successful opening of the session. I am confident that this 75th session, under the theme of empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality, will serve as a significant milestone in promoting the sustainable and 
equitable socio-economic development in the Asia-Pacific region. My delegation considers that UNS COP has fulfilled its mission and role to reach the main targets of economy, society, and environment, as reflected in 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, making significant progress. The member states are still faced with challenges and difficulties such as inequality and discrimination while implementing SDGs. Therefore, it is urgent to overcome these challenges through concerted efforts and mutual cooperation. Please allow me to take note of the following issues to facilitate the socio-economic development in the Asia-Pacific region in accordance with the theme of the current session. First of all, it is important to create peaceful environment that is conducive to accelerating the socio-economic development and achieving the SDG in the region. The Asia-Pacific region has a huge human resources making up two-thirds of the world population and extremely abundant natural resources. What is persisting in the region, however, are conflicts and disputes around the territory and interest as well as instability. As long as this situation continues, we can expect neither the respect for sovereignty and equality, nor the social economic development and implementation of SDGs in the region. The DPR Korea government has taken proactive measures one after another for the peace and security of the Korean Peninsula and the region, and is making all kinds of sincere efforts for the implementation. We consider that it will make a substantial contribution to the creation of peaceful environment in the Asia-Pacific region. Secondly, it requires legal guarantee for empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality and mutual cooperation in the process to successfully achieve the SDG. Member states should collaborate under the principle of respecting each country's legal mechanism, sovereignty, political and socio-economic system, and cultural diversity of respective countries to empower people and ensure equality and rights. It should be complete, completely ruled out to impose its intention on the other using aid as a level and attach political strings. The DPR Korea government is valuing international cooperation in the implementation of the theme of present session and the sustainable development targets and will further activate cooperation with the countries in the region. Mr. Chair, DPR Korea, from its first day of foundation, put forward empowering people and ensuring genuine rights and equality for them as the supreme principle of its activities and is making all efforts for its realization. Today, our entire people are holding the historic policy speech made by Comrade Kim Jong-un, the Chairman of the State Affairs Commission of Democratic People's Republic of Korea at the first session of the 14th Supreme People's Assembly, are turning out in the struggle for solidarity solidifying the material foundations of socialism by concentrating all national resources on economic construction with the principle of self-reliance and self-development and great achievements are being made. The DPRK government will actively strive for securing stability and constant peace in the Korean Peninsula and the region and will continue to strengthen the cooperation with UNSCAP and all member states in the regional socio-economic development and the implementation of sustainable development targets. Thank you.
Ambassador Kim, thank you very much for your statement. We wish you success and uh, prosperity. At the same time, we would like to thank you for your country's commitment to peace and stability in, uh, in our region. Thank you for your statement, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to invite Ambassador from Vietnam, your SNC uh, Bank, my neighbor, to deliver his country statement. Your SNC, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Vietnamese delegation, I would like to express our gratitude to the UN SCAP and the government of Thailand for their hospitality and excellent arrangement for the 75th session of UN SCAP. I also like to reaffirm our high appreciation for the role of UN SCAP in promoting socio-economic development cooperation on the regional level and within each member state, and the reinvigorating operational activities of UNSCAP. Mr. Chair, in recent decades, development in Asia and the Pacific often demonstrates a success story of inclusive development. More than 80% of the region's extreme poor have been lifted out of poverty resulting in improved living standards for most people. There are also improvements in income and in access to health care, education, and other key services. However, the region's income inequality has increased. Advantage groups have gained access to opportunities at a higher rate than disadvantaged ones leading to widening gaps. These continue to be obstacles from achieving the common goal to leave no one behind. In that context, we believe that with the theme empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality, the 75th session is heading towards the right direction in addressing these pressing issues. Mr. Chair, it is our view that in order to achieve equality, we need to ensure inclusion in which services and opportunities are provided to all members of societies, regardless of their age, gender, race, or religion, to fully realize their potentials. Empowerment is the tool that is for individuals to do so. It is therefore imperative to make institutional improvement and reform policy and services. Encourage all groups to participate in the decision-making process. Enhance the quality and availability of education and training and employment opportunities. Secure equitable allocations and affordable access to education enhance social security and protection and health care, enhance gender mainstreaming to ensure gender inclusive policy making, just to name a few. Mr. Chair, Vietnam firmly believes in the importance of 2030 agenda as well as the Millennium Development Goals. In order to make sure that no one got left behind, we have actively participated in the global implementation of the 2030 Agenda. An example is our full integration of the SDGs in our national action plan to implement the 2030 Agenda, reflecting 150, 150 out of 160 specific targets in the Agenda that are relevant to Vietnam's development priorities. So far, Vietnam has achieved a number of SDG-related results, just to uh, name a few, a reduction in the national multidimensional poverty rate from 99% in 2015 to less than 70% in 2017. Health insurance coverage reaching 86.4%, access to electricity by more than 99% of Vietnamese household, 
the promotion of youth as key partners in achieving SDGs, for example. These achievements are largely due to policies with a focus on accelerating economic restructuring, guaranteeing social equality, especially for disadvantaged ones, transforming growth model to improve economic quality and efficiency, ensuring responsive and inclusive decision-making at all levels, and increasing gender mainstreaming. Yet, yeah, the government of Vietnam also recognizes that there are still much needed to be done. In addition, we believe that to successfully empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality, the global partnership for sustainable development should be strengthened. Developed countries should support developing world to implement SDGs particularly through capacity building, technology transfer, trade facilitation, and access to financial resources. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say that Vietnam, as a responsible and active member of the United Nations, will aim to further contribute to the sustainable growth of the world in general, and of the Asia-Pacific region in particular, to ensure each individual will benefit from the progress towards the SDGs in an exclusive and equal manner. I wish this session great success and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador, for your statement and uh, we wish also uh, wish you success uh, from your national action plan with 150 targets. Uh, and wish you success also for your commitment to 2030 agenda. Thank you, Your, your Excellency, for your statement. Next speaker, I'd like to invite Your Excellency's Ambassador from Afghanistan, uh, Ambassador Atimal, to deliver his country statement. You had the floor, sir. His Excellency, Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. At the outset, allow me to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, on your election as the chair of this important session. Also, I would like to thank the Honorable Executive Secretary and her able team for the excellent arrangements of current session. The theme of this session, empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality, is very important for the future of a developed and peaceful Afghanistan. Mr. Chairman, allow me to briefly highlight our major ongoing efforts and achievements in pursuing an integrated approach towards our key development objectives, including those related to the theme of this year's meeting. First. The Afghan government has embarked on an ambitious reform agenda outlined under the Afghanistan National Peace and Development Framework, which was presented to the Brussels Conference on Afghanistan in October 2016. The government has also developed a number of national priority programs which cover important areas such as infrastructure development, agriculture development, rural and urban development, human capital development, private sector, and women's economic empowerment, all capable of contributing to the goal of achieving a self-reliant economy and closing gaps, including in education, employment, and income. The government has also developed a domestic production-led growth policy, a national export strategy, and a national trade policy. Second, the government has made remarkable efforts to mainstream the global development agenda into national development planning, which includes the development of Afghanistan's sustainable development goals. While bringing coherence among the Afghanistan national peace and development framework, national priority programs, as well as Vienna program of action and Istanbul program of actions. 
in order to ensure greater synergy and coherence among various global development agendas at the national level, the Istanbul Program of Action for Least Developed Countries and the Vienna Program of Action for Landlocked Developing Countries have been recently incorporated into the work of Executive Committee on SDGs, which will include the utilization of the Executive Committee as a national mechanism for coordination, coordination, monitoring, and reporting, including data collections and analysis on two programs of action. Cooperation has taken root in various sub-region buildings, solid foundation for benefiting from the enormous economic opportunities and exist across the wider region. Mr. Chairman, Afghanistan is making intensive efforts to utilize its central location as a regional land bridge in support of increased growth in Afghanistan and greater connectivity in trade in the wider region, which has resulted in prom promising progress over the past few years. The government of Afghanistan has pursued this vision under two major Afghanistan-centered regional cooperation reforms. Regional Economic Cooperation Conference on Afghanistan, RECA, and Heart of Asia Istanbul process. The next ministerial meetings of Heart of Asia Istanbul process and Regional Economic Cooperation Conference on Afghanistan will take place in the second half of this year in Istanbul and Tashkent, respectively. As we highlighted under our voluntary report on the implementation of sustainable development goals, Afghanistan National Peace and Development Framework, national priority programs, as well as Afghanistan Sustainable Development Goals, all aim at advancing sustainable development, including through increasing productivity, creating jobs, increasing access to education, and improving the delivery of essential services to the people. Thus, helping with closing the gaps and ensuring inclusive economic growth and development. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, despite the challenges related to the security and development, the government of Afghanistan is determined to implement the sustainable development goals and other development agendas. However, continued international assistance, shared responsibility and coordinated efforts, including under UNESCAP, remain essential in achieving sustainable development goals across the wider Asia and Pacific region. Thank you very much for your attention. Ambassador, thank you for your statement. We wish uh, you and your country su success and peace. As God continue to stay with Afghanistan to, con to uh, implement its uh, reform agendas. Thank you very much once again, Ambassador, for your statement. Next speaker, I'd like to invite Shashi uh, Dafre, uh, Madam Sharif from Maldives, to deliver a country statement. You have the floor, Madam. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank the UNSCAP for convening the 75th session. Let me also thank the people and government of the Kingdom of Thailand for being excellent hosts. It is an honor for me to present the Maldives country statement in this session. In 2015, we adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, a new milestone for 15 years in our joint efforts to build a society that leaves no one behind. The theme of the 75th session of the UNSCAP, empowering people and ensuring inclusive, inclusiveness and equality, is indeed very timely and relevant to the SDGs. We believe it reflects the universality of the SDGs in its strive to overcome the challenges we face today. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, ensuring quality and equitable education is a key priority of the government of Maldives. We have been successful in providing universal access to education, particularly at the pre-primary, primary, and lower secondary levels, with, with indicators showing an absolute parity between boys and girls. My government, aims to decentralize the education system 
to provide accessible and equal standards of quality education throughout the country. To achieve this, regional hubs for education will be created. Interventions in this regard include the integration of children with disabilities in mainstream education by making sure all classrooms can cater to children with special needs, both in terms of facilities and trained educators. This is in line with our commitments under the various human rights conventions. School infrastructure will be overhauled to ensure accessibility to children with special needs. Affordable education will be available to students with low income families and scholarships will be provided in social and economic priority areas. The government has already announced the provision of free undergraduate education in Maldives and reviewed the president's uh, scholarship scheme to include more countries where education will be provided. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, the Maldives is committed to the principle of gender equality through numerous national and international commitments. Despite progress achieved in this area, a number of challenges still remain. The government is developing a number of strategies to address them, including efforts to mainstream gender issues within the national development framework, to increase the role of women in social, economic, and political decision making. The government has increased budget allocations for local women's development committees throughout the country. The government will also strive to ensure that more women occupy executive level positions and aims to eliminate barriers to women's employment in high growth sectors and support community efforts in promoting women's employment. The government is also committed to ensure the implementation of current laws and regulations designed to mitigate gender-based violence. Furthermore, under His Excellency President Ibrahim Mohamed Solis, Solis Blue Economy Vision of Development, increase in national productivity is a priority for the Maldives. This is envisaged to trickle its benefits nationwide, especially to those people whose livelihoods depend entirely on fishing and related industries. The government is also deeply committed to the principles of good governance and democracy, the benefits of which will reach the wider population and in turn contribute to our sustainable development goals. We believe that our national efforts, complemented by support from our bilateral and multilateral partners, will pave the way towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Our commitments to the SDGs remain staunch, and the government of Maldives will make every effort to work together with the international community to make a difference in the lives of our people. Before I conclude, I'm pleased to note that the Maldives has recently opened an embassy in Thailand with the aim of not just enhancing our bilateral cooperation, but also our multilateral engagements with organizations such as ESCAP. We hope to continue our close engagements on the myriad of issues that will be taken up during this session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates. Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you for your statement on behalf of the Maldives, uh, Madame Sharif, the Shashit Affair uh, from the Embassy of Maldives. Thank you very much for your statement. Uh, U.S. can continue to support uh, your country uh, for the success of your national development programs, in particular in on education sector. Again, thank you for your statement. Let's speak a right to invite uh, Mr. Wong Kai Jun, Shashit Affair from the Embassy of Singapore in Bangkok to deliver uh, his statement, please. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, good morning. The Singapore delegation would like to express our appreciation to the UN ESCAP for organizing the 75th Commission. Singapore firmly believes that everyone, especially the most vulnerable, should be empowered to make the most of every opportunity to better their lives. In this regard, please allow me to share some of Singapore's initiatives to support social mobility, while also providing more targeted support for the vulnerable. Under our social compact, the Singapore government ensures access to affordable basic services, creates opportunities for growth, provides institutional support, and an enabling environment for individuals as they work hard to look after themselves and their families with support from the community. 
when individuals are unable to provide for themselves, or when family or community support are inadequate, there are social security nets in place. In addition to catering for the retirement needs, employment, home ownership, health care, and education of all citizens, the Singapore government also provides targeted assistance for the low income, vulnerable, and those with special needs. For example, we have made major investments in our preschools and school system to ensure that every child has access to quality education and a good start in life, regardless of income. For healthcare, we adopt a multi-tiered approach to ensure that no Singaporean is denied access to healthcare due to financial difficulties. Mr. Chairman, Singapore believes that everyone is differently abled and can do well in life, given the right support and opportunities. To this end, we have embarked on three enabling master plans to chart our direction towards a more caring and inclusive society where persons with disabilities or special needs are empowered to participate fully in our society. For example, for children with developmental needs, we aim to give them a good start in life by ensuring that they have timely access to quality early intervention services. We support students as they move from school to the next stage of life through programs that match students who are able to work to suitable training and employment pathways based on their strengths and interests. Mr. Chairman, the world's population is aging. According to data from the World Population Prospects, the number of older persons aged over 60 is expected to more than double by 2050 and to more than triple by the year 2100. Singapore's life expectancy at birth has risen from 83.2 years in 2010 to 84.8 years in 2017. Given that Singaporeans are living longer, healthier lives, longevity is also an opportunity to be embraced. Singapore's Action Plan for Successful Aging, announced in 2015, is a national blueprint to help Singaporeans age confidently and lead active lives. At the individual level, we have created opportunities for seniors to continue working and learning. For example, we established the National Silver Academy in 2016, which offers more than a thousand courses on a wide range of topics such as health and wellness, financial adequacy, and digital literacy to support the aspirations of seniors to continue learning. The Singapore Health Promotion Board has also rolled out a National Seniors Health Program to empower seniors to take charge of their health. We have made hardware improvements, building a comprehensive suite of facilities to transform Singapore into a city for all ages, where our seniors can age gracefully. Mr. Chairman, modern Singapore was built on the efforts of our men and women, while Singapore has come a long way since then, achieving equality is a dynamic process and a work in progress. To this end, Singapore has instituted multiple policies and measures to empower our women further. Singapore has established a Council for Board Diversity to promote the representation of women on the boards of companies and organisations. The Council does so by engaging stakeholders on the appointment of women into boards and raising awareness of the importance of board diversity. To keep women's employment rate high, Singapore facilitates employment opportunities and helps women to meet their career and family responsibilities. The Adapt and Grow Initiative of Singapore helps job seekers to find jobs, including women who wish to return to the workforce. We also support the provision of flexible work arrangements so that women can stay in the workforce. We also actively engage with civil society, such as the Singapore Council of Women's Organisations, to conceive programmes for women's development. Mr Chairman, Excellencies, as we move further into the digital age, we must be cognizant that upgrading our hardware must come hand in hand with improvements to our hardware, our people. Singapore will continue working hand in hand with ASCAP and, our and its member countries to build an inclusive and equal society for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evan, for your statement on behalf of Singapore. Thank you for sharing your initiatives and experiences. We wish you uh, greater successes. We also look forward to your fourth uh, 
uh, generational leadership transition in the coming times and uh, with your success. Next, I would like to invite uh, Madame uh, Jadusan, uh, a bushman of uh, Turkmenistan, to deliver her statement. Madame, you have the floor. Thank you. Господин председательствующий, уважаемые дамы и господа, разрешите поприветствовать вас от лица туркменской делегации, поблагодарить за высокий уровень организации данной встречи и создание возможности выступить, пожелать вам всем участникам успешной работы, плодотворного обмена мнением. Выступая на мировой арене с позиции соблюдения верховенства права, Туркменистан через Конституцию в полной мере обеспечил претворение жизни основополагающих элементов верховенства права в своем государственном строе и через него в системе устройства институтов государственного управления. В результате конституционной реформы в сентябре 2016 года принята новая редакция Конституции Туркменистана который способствует дальнейшему развитию и совершенствованию политической системы, создает основу для эффективного развития социально-экономических и общественно-политических процессов. В новой редакции Конституции впервые закреплено, что страна является государством, гарантирующим социальную защищенность каждого человека. Одним словом, сегодня основной закон Туркменистана выступает надежным гарантом прав и свобод граждан, прочным правовым фундаментом прогрессивных реформ и крупномасштабных социально-экономических преобразований, проводимых в стране под руководством президента страны и нацеленных на процветание отчизны, обеспечение счастливой и благополучной жизни всех туркменистанцев. Вопросы устойчивого развития имеют особую актуальность для всех стран мира и для всех его регионов, и в том числе и для Туркменистана. Правительство Туркменистана в своих подходах к реализации целей устойчивого развития исходит из четкого понимания необходимости в этой работы совместных усилий правительства с частным сектором, неправительственными организациями и гражданским обществом. Ярким воплощением целей и задач по устойчивому развитию явилось принятие в 2018 году, в 2018 году программы президента Туркменистана по социально-экономическому развитию страны на 2018-2024 годы. Данная президентская программа определены конкретные пути реализации по обеспечению дальнейшего прогресса посредством внедрения целей устойчивого развития во всех отраслях национальной экономики. В ней представлены планы реализации рыночных реформ, диверсификация отраслей экономики и форм собственности, укрепление индустриальной мощи страны, обеспечение устойчивых темпов экономического роста, достижение мировых стандартов в интеллектуальном развитии и жизненных условиях населения, последовательное повышение занятости и социально-бытового уровня. В соответствии с национальными и международными интересами в стране проводятся меры по рациональному использованию природных богатств нашей страны, бережному использованию водных и энергетических ресурсов, формированию современной транспортно-логистической и транзитной инфраструктуры, систем связи и телекоммуникации. В президентской программе значительное место уделяется водной, энергетической и транспортной дипломатии, обеспечение водой и ее экономное использование, повышение мер по охране окружающей среды в связи с изменением климата. Благодаря заботам президента страны осуществляется целовая работа по охране водных богатств страны, использованию имеющихся рек, водохранилищ, прочих источников, 
улучшение мелоративного состояния земель, строительству и использованию водных систем и сооружений. В данном направлении основным масштабным задачем являются строительство в пустыне Каракумы, Туркменского озера Альтанасар и подводящих к нему каналов, закладка социально-производственного комплекса нового образца, который будет включать в себя современную социально-бытовую инфраструктуру, производственные объекты, животноводческие, рыбоводческие, аграрные комплексы, комплексы и так далее, а также успешное осуществление специальной программы по обеспечению населения страны чистой питьевой водой. Проводится широкомасштабная работа по обеспечению населения страны надежными, стабильными и современными источниками энергии. Отпуск населения природного газа, электроэнергии по доступным ценам является одним из основных достижений Туркменистана в данном направлении. Еще одно направление, одно направление цели устойчивого развития связано с содействием системному, многосторонному и стабильному экономическому росту посредством решения задачи наиболее полного использования трудовых ресурсов предоставление достойной и творческой работы для всех людей. В рамках программ и планов, принятых, осуществляемых по инициативе главы государства, на вновь созданных предприятиях создаются тысячи новых рабочих мест, что решает вопросы трудовой занятости населения. Проводится большая работа по созданию систем современного технологического обеспечения, широких преобразований путем осуществления всеобщей и устойчивой индустриализации национальной экономики и внедрению решающих новшеств производства и управления. Оно также согласуется с одной из целей устойчивого развития. Поэтому прокладка железных дорог, автомобильных магистралей, возведение морского порта, аэропортов, прогрессирующаяся динамика отраслей перерабатывающей промышленности, строительство и ввод крупных предприятий инновационного характера, часть масштабной деятельности в этом направлении. Внедрение и развитие информационных технологий в различных сферах жизнедеятельности в нашей стране осуществляется в соответствии с концепцией развития цифровой экономики в Туркменистане в 2019 и 2025 годы, постановлением президента Туркменистана. Следует отметить, что Туркменистан в текущем году готовит добровольный национальный обзор по достижению принятых Туркменистаном целей, задач, индикаторов устойчивого развития. И целевой индикатор базируется на реализуемых в Туркменистане перспективных национальных социально-экономических и секторальных программах, стратегиях планах действия, нормативах, а также глобальных целях устойчивого развития на период до 2030 года. Обзор готовится по, по семи целям. Подготовка данного обзора позволяет по-новому взглянуть на предпри, принятые меры в Туркменистане, а также определить дальнейшие шаги по осуществлению целей устойчивого развития. Сославшись на вышеперечисленные, хочу отметить, что все проводимые в Туркменистане реформы, реализация программ, планов и проектов осуществляются на благо нашего народа, укреплению социальной защищенности населения страны и достижению ими широких возможностей в реализации своих законных прав, а также во имя безопасности мира и благополучной жизни всего человечества. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you, Madam Sadanson from Turkmenistan for your statement. We wish you success on your new constitution, which is very important uh, steps uh, forward. And uh, please be ensure of uh, UNS CAP uh, cooperation and support for your presidential uh, development programs uh, in your country. Thank you very much for your statement. Next speaker, right to invite. Uh, The representative from Malaysia, uh, Mr. Abdul Halim Aziz, Director, Equality Development Division, Ministry of Economic Affairs. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. First of all, I would like to thank 
uh, ASCAP for giving us opportunity to share our experience in this seventh, uh, 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 75th session of ASCAP with the theme of empowering people and ensuring inclusive and, and equality. I also would like to take opportunity to, on behalf of people of Malaysia, to, to convey uh, our deepest condolences to governments and the people of Thailand over a sudden demise of the gender plan Tin Sula Lunda, former Prime Minister of Thailand, on 26 May 2019. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the governments of Malaysia, I would like to say on this stage that Malaysia has continuously embraced sustainable developments in our national development agenda. In this regard, the commitments to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has been mapped with the current Malaysia Development Plan to align strategies and initiatives to support the Sustainable Development Goals. The first phase of a Malaysian SDG roadmap has been developed to provide guidance for the smooth implementation of the 17 SDGs. The roadmap takes into account the nation's capacity and capability in achieving the identified goals and targets of the 2030 Agenda. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests and delegates, Malaysia pursue economic growth and equality development strategies with well-being and well-being of the people in mind, along with the philosophy of growth with equity and growth with distributions. Inclusive development planning addresses societal inequality uh, and make sure that every segment of the society will benefit from the developments irrespective of ethnic, gender, social economic status, and ge geographic uh, locations. These principles are also in tandem with the spirit of leaving no one behind under the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the United Nations. Malaysia's effort to enhance inclusive development and well-being are aimed to create are aimed at creating a more equitable society through measures uh, to increase income and bridge social economic imbalances. Meanwhile, emphasis is also given to further strengthening the social protection system in order to ensure the vulnerable groups are protected from any form of shock that could adversely affect their quality of lives. In doing so, targeting mechanism of social assistance programs will be improved to ensure that the target groups are provided with the assistance according to merits and their specific needs. Mr. Chairman, Distinguished delegates, Malaysia will continue to pursue the use of technology as an integral element to bolster economic growth. More knowledge intensive and skilled workforce will be the backbone to support the economic sectors in moving up the value chain. Meanwhile, the provisions of quality infrastructure in terms of improving connectivity, efficiency, and reliability will further spur economic growth. These concerted efforts will enhance productivity and ensure Malaysia remains on track to become a developed and inclusive nation. Moving forward, emphasis will be given to address relative and multi-dimensional poverty issues. The well-being of the people remains an utmost priority in manifesting a balanced development approach. Better access to quality education and skill training as well as uh, entrepreneurship programs 
will be skilled, will be uh, will be enhanced to provide social mobility and elevate the uh, elevate the social well-being towards inclusive and prosperous Malaysia. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, Malaysia. Malaysia will continue to give a support to the ASCAP in terms of these uh, programs. And with that note, I thank you. Mr. Director, thank you very much for your statements and for sharing with us your experiences. And uh, also, uh, ASCAP and Malaysia will work together closely for the benefits of our people, and in particular for the Malaysian. At the same time, I'd like to, uh, to say how much we were impressed by the return of uh, the return of Dr. Mahathir to the national leadership. And uh, we wish him uh, good health, good health and uh, longevity. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Director, for your statement. I would like to next speaker to invite Mr. Uh, Cecily, uh, Chief of Staff, Office of the President of Palau, to deliver his statement. You had the floor. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity for Palau to present its uh, brief statement. First, I would like to uh, extend our gratitude to the Royal Thai Government for graciously hosting our commission for the past many, many years. I also want to thank the management and staff of uh, the UNSCAP under the great leadership of uh, Madam Executive Secretary for the wonderful organization and arrangements making our traveling here to this great city of Bangkok a pleasant one. Ladies and gentlemen, the overarching mission of this great regional body of nations is to make our world a better place through economic and social cooperation and partnership among the member states. Each year, we come together to discuss important issues affecting our respective states' socioeconomic developments. This year's session, our theme focuses on empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and, and equality. It could not be any more relevant than this, because this is, a, this is the very fundamental principle that this institu institution should strive for. Our world will never be better if the people are not empowered to make progress in their lives. The survivability of the people will be at greater risk without income security, without food security, without cultural security, and without socioeconomic security. And our communities will never prosper if our empowerment efforts are not inclusive of everyone and the opportunities are not equi equitably distributed. At least that is what our Blue Pacific strategy for the Pacific Island Forum is all about, alleviating risks and ensuring sustainable livelihood of the people. This is the reason why in our Agenda 2030, we have committed to sustainability. We are making sustainability a priority for all ac activities of this body. This means including sustainability in our day-to-day -day operations. This means ensuring sustainability in all aspects of organizing our agenda. This means engaging all stakeholders to also commit to sustainability. Like many island nations, Palau shares similar challenges that are affecting progress in our region. Palau experiences the series of existential threat of climate change every single day. That is making us rethink our development strategy, and that gives all of us even more urgency and determination to make sustainable, sustainability a priority in all our planning and activities. That is why Palau is taking on in initiative to preserve significant portion of our ocean area, 80% to be exact, for the sustainable management of our marine resources. Palau is committed to achieving 45% percent renewable energy target by 2025. This will allow us to maximize 
on the abundance of available clean energy sources to achieve sustainable economic growth, as well as contributing to SDG number seven, affordable and clean energy. Palau has launched a strategic camp campaign to encourage all our visitors to uphold the Palau Pledge to help protect and sustain our environment for the sake of Palau's children and the future generations across the world. The future of the planet belongs to them, and all of us have the responsibility to build a sustainable future for everyone, everywhere. As a small economy, Palau is also faced with a number of development challenges, including the lack of economies of scale due to our being small and remote economy. The changing dynamics of our population is presenting a greater challenge for us to maintain productivity and economic growth. That is why we are now looking into more innovative approaches to overcome these challenges. Public-private partnership has become more relevant solution to sustain our growth. Use of digital technology to build on digital communities and knowledge-based knowledge platforms have transformed our way of life, and this has become the thing of the century. Friends, today, wherever we live in this world, whether a remote island in the vast ocean space, beaches and coral reefs, or a massive landmass with the snow-capped mountains, deserts, rainforests, and rivers, we are all linked together by the digital world. It has brought us even closer and even more efficient. We have no more excuses of not able to work together because of the distance between us. In conclusion, I wish to say that Palau is committed to continue in our small ways to contribute to the purpose of this great institution. We will continue to support and strive to meet our goals to ensure sustainable development with no one left behind, the empowerment of the people in an inclusive and equitable manner. With continued spirit of cooperation and partnership, we will achieve a lot more of our common goals for the survival and the prosperity of our people. Thank you for keeping that spirit alive here in this beautiful Thailand. Masula. Thank you, Mr. Cecilio, Chief of Staff, Office of the President, for your statement. You escaped the right to recognize your commitment to uh, sustainability and your efforts on uh, uh, improvement of the livelihood of your people. Uh, we wish the Paula uh, success and prosperity. Last year, I had a, a great pleasure to visit your, your country. It is beautiful. I urge some of you is, in the future to visit uh, Paola. It's really beautiful. Yeah, you should go one day. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cecilil, for your statement. I would like to invite our next speaker from Australia, Mr. Paul Stephen, Stephens, Ministers and Deputy Head of Mission from the Australian Embassy in Bangkok. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Australia wishes to acknowledge Thailand's hosting of the 75th Commission and the Executive Secretary uh, and the ESCAP Secretariat for their continuing support to member states. This year's theme of empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality captures the broad ambition of the 2030 Agenda. Australia is committed to realising the dignity of the most marginalised members of our communities. Australia's foreign policy white paper issued in late 2017 underlines our commitment to promoting an open, inclusive and prosperous Indo-Pacific region in which the rights of all states are respected. Promoting and protecting the international rules-based order that supports our region's stability and prosperity enables us to tackle these development challenges together and most effectively. The Commission's theme study has highlighted that women, rural residents, younger people, persons with disabilities and those aged over 50 are the most disadvantaged and vulnerable in our region. While some progress has been made in sharing the benefits of economic growth, there remains much to, do, much to be done to narrow the gap and ensure that disadvantaged groups have the same opportunities to reach their full potential. 
Mr Chairman, in the Pacific, Australia is enhancing our relations with our Pacific partners and regional organisations as part of our Pacific Step Up. We are stepping up support for regional infrastructure development because we know that well-planned, well-built and well-maintained infrastructure can boost sustainable economic growth, enhance economic integration and deliver broader development outcomes. To this end, the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific will invest two billion Australian dollars to support vital infrastructure development in the Pacific region. Mr Chairman, we know that societies that protect human rights and gender equality are much more likely to be productive and stable. Consistent with the theme and the concept of leaving no one behind, Australia believes strongly in the universal, indivisible and inalienable nature of human rights. As the first country from the Pacific to serve on the U UN Human Rights Council, Australia is pleased to engage closely with our Pacific neighbours to promote the interests and concerns of our region. We have brought focus on the particular barriers faced by people with disabilities in the region and the valuable work of the Pacific to increase women's participation in public life, especially those who live in rural and remote communities. We warmly welcome Fiji in joining the Council this year as the first ever Pacific Island member. Mr Chairman, an efficient, effective and fit for purpose UN development system is vital for all people in our region, particularly disadvantaged and vulnerable groups. Australia is a strong supporter of the UN Secretary General's wide-ranging reforms which have the support of member states. These changes are needed to ensure the UN is able to adapt to 21st century realities and deliver on its mandate in the future. Australia looks forward to engaging in the next phase of the UN's development system reforms, focusing on regional assets and architecture, including the regional commissions. It's key that we have a coherent UN presence across our region, with UN agencies working together and less duplication to allow more resources for program delivery on the ground. Mr Chairman, the Asia Pacific is the world's most disaster prone region. In the Asia Pacific, an individual is twice as likely to be affected by disaster as a person living in Africa, almost six times as likely compared with Latin America and the Caribbean, and 30 times more likely than a person living in North America or Europe. We know with climate change, increasing urbanization and environmental degradation, these risks are expected to increase. To help strengthen our collective understanding of disaster risks, risks, Australia is pleased to host the Asia-Pacific Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in July 2020. Hosting the conference will provide an opportunity to share our experiences and learn from our neighbours which face similar challenges. Working together will help us to save lives, minimise economic loss and ensure no one is left behind during and after a disaster. Mr Chairman, sport can make significant contributions towards the SDGs and Australia has recently launched our Sports Diplomacy 2030 strategy. Sport can help encourage healthy lives, education and learning, gender equality and peaceful and inclusive societies. Through the new Australian Sports Partnerships Program, sporting organisations will be able to partner with civil society and the private sector to find innovative ways to tackle social issues the program will work specifically to empower women, strengthen disability inclusion and create leadership pathways. Mr Chairman, in conclusion, Australia supports the UN High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development as the mechanism for follow-up and review of the SDGs. Australia was pleased to have presented our first voluntary national review to the forum in 2018. For SCAP member states, these reviews are an opportunity to improve the global community's understanding of our region's unique circumstances. Australia looks forward to continuing our partnership with member states, the Executive Secretary and the Secretariat, and to working together to ensure that our region's prosperity is shared among all peoples. Thank you. Thank you for your statements, Ministers and Deputy Head of Mission from the Embassy of Australia, thank you for your statement and thanks for sharing with us the results of the surveys on uh, vulnerable groups. 
And of course, uh, here I would like to say I might be appreciate the uh, roles and dynamic roles and engagement of Australia in our region and also in our international organizations. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your statement. Next speaker, I would like to invite a, a representative from the United States of America, Mr. Douglas Apostol, Consular and Permanent Representative of the SCAP, the Embassy of the United States in, in Bangkok, to deliver the statement. You had the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, distinguished colleagues, I'm honored to represent the United States of America at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. The United States welcomes this year's theme of empowering people and ensuring inclusion and equality. Good governance, debt sustainability, protecting human rights, fostering science, technology, and innovation, developing partnerships, and protecting the environment are critical to ensure inclusiveness and equality. We should carefully consider the role SCAP has to play in promoting inclusiveness and equality as a means to advance sustainable economic growth and development. The United States is dedicated to country-led, market-driven economic development that unlocks the potential of all citizens. This commitment is reflected in our approach as the largest donor of official development assistance in the world and as a source of significant private sector investment for growth in developing countries. The United States works with new and non-traditional partners to promote equality and inclusion. We work with those partners to harness cutting edge technologies, to accelerate research and development, and to scale up innovation, including here in the Asia-Pacific region. Science, technology, and innovation will enable us to address income, health, environmental, and other development challenges that exacerbate inequality. Mr. Chairman, over the past 70 years, the United States has prioritized freedom, openness, peace, and prosperity across the Asia-Pacific region. Our continuous and ongoing programs support good governance, the rule of law, civil society, independent media, elections and political processes, and human rights. Our work is driven by three focus areas, good sound governance, just governance, and responsive governance. Mr. Chairman, sound governance programs increase public, center account public sector accountability and transparency, foster access to information, strengthen anti-corruption measures, promote responsible borrowing, and encourage honest and open procurement and public financial management practices. Just governance programs strengthen the rule of law by supporting national and subnational legislatures and government institutions. These programs promote legal and judicial reforms in accordance with international standards. They strengthen the integrity of elections and political processes and promote political party development. They strengthen inclusive public participation in policymaking and build capacity to investigate and prosecute financial and other crimes. Thirdly, responsible governance programs promote a strong, active civil society by supporting organizations that foster fundamental freedoms and human rights. Such programs support grassroots social accountability initiatives, strengthen civic education, and increase the participation of women and minorities. They expand people-to-people -people exchanges and increase access to credible information through thriving independent media. Looking forward, good governance, job creation, and equal employment opportunities will drive inclusive and sustainable development. Countries attract more investment when they, rep when they respect human rights, minority and marginalized groups, the rule of law, democratic processes, and institutions. These principles are important for all countries, regardless of the respective levels of economic development. But the United States is concerned that linkages between human rights and sustainable development have not been more clearly articulated in this forum. 
We underscore the importance of achieving equality between women and men and promoting women's economic empowerment. We will achieve our development objectives only if all members of society are fully and equitably engaged. This means the policies must aim to empower both women and men. And you will note that I put women before men in that sentence. The United States steadfastly supports efforts to advance women's equality, protect the rights of women and girls, and promote the empowerment of women and youth. If you would allow me a word about the issue of corruption, Mr. Chairman. Corruption undermines economic growth, hinders development, and weakens citizens' faith in democracy. Corruption has a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable people and is a serious drag on economic growth. All countries must develop a comprehensive and inclusive strategy to fight corruption, including through engagement with civil society and the private sector. This issue should be at the center of our deliberations on regional cooperation and collaboration. The private sector has a key role to play in creating sustainable and inclusive growth. The United States government collaborates, co-finances, and co-designs programs, tools, resources, and other initiatives with the private sector. We embrace the creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship of private enterprise. The private sector is a driver and sustainer of development, and we need to re-envision the public sector's role accordingly. Mr. Chairman, the Asia-Pacific region can become a model of sustainable, inclusive development. But to achieve this, we must all hold ourselves to the highest standards of quality, transparency, and inclusivity. No one country holds the answer, and no single country-sponsored program can replace meaningful national consultation on development goals. While we have made remarkable progress toward alleviating poverty and fostering development, we still have much to do. We look forward to working with SCAP, as well as with the private sector, civil society's grassroots activists, academia, and faith-based and philanthropic organizations to create and provide greater opportunities for all our citizens. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Councillor, for your statement on behalf of the United States. I'd like to thank the United States for its uh, engagement and contribution to our region. Next speaker, I'd like to invite Mr. Amil Ahmadov from the Ministries of uh, Transport and Communications and High Technologies from Azerbaijan. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, dear Mr. Chair, dear delegates, uh, at the outset, allow me to express my congratulations to you on your election as a chairperson of 75th session of commission, and I am confident under your leadership, the session will be crowned a great success. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to UNSCOP and the government of and people of Thailand for hospitality and excellent arrangement of this commission. We believe that uh, this mature organization has a good potential to respond to emerging challenges and to serve as a platform for exchange of best practice and, of course, generating a new ideas. Dear Mr. Chair, the recent report of, uh, released by UNSCAP demonstrated that uh, Asia Pacific has emerged as a whole, uh, world fastest growing region over the past. On the other hand, dynamic development has been accompanied by rising inequality. Such trend uh, has posed a significant challenge to the international community in realizing SDG within the set timeline. During the last 15 years, our economy grew more than three times. Infrastructure projects are very important for us, and we used our financial resources to invest in the creation of modern infrastructure. We have built diverse rail railroad network connecting us with our neighbors. 15,000 kilometers of roads and highways were built in Azerbaijan during the last 15 years. Talking about the trans transportation infrastructure, I want to add investment in air transport. Six international airport is, uh, is our another contribution to modern transportation infrastructure. We strongly believe that no nations can succeed alone without regional and international cooperation. In this regard, projects will narrow inequality within the country and, of course, between the country. It's a well-known fact that 
sustainable economic development uh, within the country can be fully provided if you have more or less predictable situation beyond your border. And therefore, we in Azerbaijan attach great importance to promoting cooperation with countries of UNSCAP region and look forward to deep in uh, integration with our existing partners. The government of Azerbaijan has initiated a number of big projects in the field of energy, transport, and information communication technology. Among those, I can name Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline, Baku Tbilisi Erzurum gas pipeline, as well as a number of other infrastructure projects where Azerbaijan is active participant. I should underline that the above mentioned project stood as a symbol of genuine spirit of regional cooperation. Located on the strategic crossroads of East and West, Azerbaijan is open to potential new initiative on expansion interregional energy connectivity and bringing Central Asia closer to European energy architecture. Of course, policy of diversification of economy is a very important element for every country, especially rich with oil and gas. This policy successfully implemented in Azerbaijan. Development of non-oil sector is priority for the government of Azerbaijan. Being a landlocked uh, developing country, Azerbaijan is nevertheless is advancing in building interconnectivity in the region. Our vision of interconnectivity played an important role in shaping the patterns of regional transport network. Azerbaijan is crucial enabler and strong promoter of both north-south and east-west transport corridor. And development of this corridor covers connecting national railroad system and creating relevant infrastructure. Azerbaijan is a starting point of strategic Baku Tbilisi cars railroad inaugurated in 2017. And this project not only connects three countries, it connects the continents. And physical infra, uh, interconnection of railroad is not self-sufficient for us. In order to render it commercially viable, we are currently working on uh, tariff unification. Azerbaijan has largest fleet of 260 ships in the Caspian Sea. There is also a shipyard in Azerbaijan built relatively recently, capable of producing all type of vessels. Last year, we inaugurated the new international seaport of Baku, capable to transport 50 million tons of cargo and 100,000 containers. In the future, the transportation capability of port will grow up to 25 million tons of cargoes, including 1 million containers. By creating modern transportation logistic infrastructure, we not only transform our country into important transportation hub, but also contribute to the cooperation with countries involved in east-west and north-south corridor. Development and growth in the modern age is directly associated with application of ICT. Building ICT connectivity can bridge the digital divide and provide new solution to development challenges, access to information and knowledge, as well as have immense impact on social progress. We are also committed uh, to meeting SDGs and in order to harmonize our national development policy with sustainable development goals, Coordination Council on Sustainable Development headed by Deputy Prime Minister was created in October 2016. The three, four working groups within the Council gathered on permanent basis to review progress made and to set a new goals. As a result of work already done, I can point out that voluntarily national report on implementation of these goals by Azerbaijan was submitted to UN, UN in 2017. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, we do believe that UNESCO will continue to play active role in promoting cooperation in the region and to address existing challenge and coordinating gen, joint efforts of its member states for the benefits of the region as a whole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amado, for your statement. We, ESCAP, will continue to support uh, your country. And uh, thank you very much for sharing with us your positive conditions in your country and your commitment uh, uh, to build a better uh, Azerbaijan yeah, in the near future. Thank you very much once again. Now, next speaker, I'd like to invite Mr. Lee Shenjun from Hong Kong, China, Director of Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Bangkok. You have the floor, sir. Okay. Your Excellency, the Chairman, Executive Secretary, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Hong Kong China delegation, I congratulate the government of Thailand and the Escape Secretariat on the very successful organization of this meeting. I'm also grateful to the government and the people of Thailand for the very warm hospitality extended to us. In the 2019 to 20 financial year, 
the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region government's recurrent spending on social welfare reached 84.3 billion Hong Kong dollars, which is equivalent to 10.9 billion US dollars, or 19.1 percent of the total recurrent government expenditure of the year. In fact, this figure has almost doubled as compared with debt in the 2012 to 13 financial year, demonstrating the Hong Kong SAR government's staunch commitment on the well-being of our citizens. The general principle underpinning our welfare system is to help underprivileged people capable of working by offering them opportunities to become self-reliant and improve their livelihood while devoting public resources to those who cannot provide for themselves. This principle is manifested in our different systems. Taking our social security as an example, in Hong Kong, we have put in place a non-contributory social security system to provide assistance to people in need, which includes the safety net. We call it the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance, or CSSA scheme, for those who cannot support themselves financially for reasons such as old age, disability, unemployment, single parenthood, etc. At the same time, it encourages and supports people capable of working to achieve self-reliance through job training and counselling. The self-reliance spirit of Hong Kong people is reflected in the continuous decrease of unemployment cases under the aforesaid CSSA scheme over the years. The latest statistics shows that the number of such cases has decreased for 10 consecutive years to a 20-year low, with a drop of about 80% from its peak. In June 2018, we have also introduced the higher OH living allowance under the social security system. It provides a monthly payment of 3,585 Hong Kong dollars equivalent to 460 US dollars after a simple and relatively lenient mean test. This new scheme is now benefiting about half a million elderly persons, representing around 40% of our elderly population. The principle of self-reliance and targeted use of public resources has stands out prominently in our Working Family Allowance Scheme. We are aware that there are households working for hours but are still prone to poverty because of the relatively low income and the need to support their children. To this end, the government launched the scheme in May 2016 as a pro-employment and pro-children initiative to encourage self-reliance through employment and ease intergenerational poverty. Apart from providing payments for households fulfilling the working hour requirements, a child allowance is especially granted to each eligible ch child or youth in the household. We believe that giving these poor children or young members more means for learning opportunities will promote the younger generation's upward mobility. We introduced some major improvements to the scheme in 2018, which include relaxing the application criteria and raising the rates of allowances. We hope the scheme will benefit more house working households. Mr. Chairman, looking ahead, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government will continue to work with all sectors to improve the well-being of the disadvantaged. Thank you very much. Director Lee, thank you for your statement. Thank you for sharing with us your, your programs in support of people with special needs. Thank you very much Chair, for your statement. Uh, the next nice speaker right to invite from the European Union, uh, Mr. Bussini, Deputy Chief of Mission, Permanent Observer to ESCAP to mm -hmm. Thailand to deliver his st union statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Executive Secretary, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> On behalf of the European Union as permanent observer to UNESCAP, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be uh, given the floor today at this important meeting. Four years ago, 
at the 70th UN General Assembly, world leaders adopted the new Global and Sustainable Development Framework, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, with the SDGs as key principles of leaving no one behind. I'm glad to uh, recall that the EU was uh, a very active partner and played an important role in, in shaping this uh, uh, 2030 agenda within the UN system. And we were extremely pleased with its outcome. Uh, let me also stress that uh, these principles uh, have been uh, integrally translated into the EU uh, internal development policy um, in the so-called New European Consensus on Development, uh, which uh, is, a, is a set of principles that are uh, applied by both the EU and uh, its member states in implementing their uh, development policies. This would not be complete without recalling also that we have been devoting considerable uh, financial resources to implementing this uh, uh, strategy. Um, I would like to mention that, for instance, in the uh, last six years, uh, the European Union and its member states have put more than 90 uh, billion euros uh, in uh, uh, their development policies, and this is forecast to increase in the next budgetary cycle uh, from 2021 to 2027. Uh, the exact figures are not yet decided, but we can foresee that there will be a considerable increase in this financial amount, which makes us the largest uh, contributor to development aid globally. Um, Coming to today's theme, uh, I'm glad to uh, uh, stress that uh, empowering people and inclusiveness uh, has been one of the main uh, have been one of the main principles of the EU and the uh, promotion of inclusiveness and people emp empowerment in all its actions around the world. Engaging with people, increasing ownership of the beneficiaries, working with civil society organizations and reaching out to, to populations in need, indeed, leaving no one behind, has been a cornerstone of our development policy. The approach, which complements the more direct bilateral assistance with local governments, has helped deliver a more efficient and effective development assistance, bringing about better results for the populations we want to support. Now, as far as the uh, sustainable development goals uh, uh, we want to discuss today are concerned. Uh, let me just mention a few concrete examples of what the EU has been doing in the Asia-Pacific region. For instance, on SDG 4, quality education, we must ensure that education and lifelong learning opportunities are offered to all and also to conflict-affected children, including migrant children who are often left behind. In this context, the EU Regional Children on the Move project, implemented by UNICEF in eight countries in Central Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia, is establishing protection systems for children in migration, including access to educational, vocational training, health and legal aid services. As regards Goal 8 on labour migration, labour rights must be protected and safe and secure working environments for all workers must be promoted, particularly migrant workers in hazardous environments. In Thailand, for instance, the EU has promoted a ship-to-shore project, which is being implemented by the ILO, and which has been contributing to the fight against unacceptable forms of work in the fishing and seafood industry. Always talking about the same SDG 8, but on decent work this time, we need to tackle, among others, issues related to uh, limited women's participation in the economy, which is es essential for sustainable development and economic growth. This has already been mentioned by other speakers that preceded me. And I'm glad to recall, for instance, that we have just started implementing a, a very ambitious project. It's called EU We Empower Asia. Uh, with the uh, cooperation of, of uh, UN women to build capacity for women entrepreneurs to have better access to business opportunities. And this is being implemented in China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam. 
Goal 10, sustainable goal 10 on inequalities. We need to focus, among other things again, on inequality between women and men and on issues such as violence against women and girls. The EU and the UN launched the Spotlight Initiative in 2017 to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls worldwide. The EU, as the main contributor to this project, has provided 500 million euros, the largest single commitment to eliminate violence against women ever. But let me also recall, uh, for instance, the Safe and Fair program, uh, which is being implemented in Southeast Asia, where the Spotlight program uh, is uh, also uh, being implemented by UN Women and the ILO and is focusing primarily on ending female trafficking and labor exploitation. And in the Pacific region, a 50 million initiative will work to end domestic violence in the region. Those interventions are just exa examples. I'm glad that I, I was given the opportunity to mention this. There are many more. Uh, but these are particularly relevant to our discussion today. First, because they are implemented in close partnership with civil society organizations. Secondly, because they address inequality, not only poverty reduction. They help ensure that no one is left behind from all points of view. And third and last, they adopt a holistic approach when it comes to SDGs. All the goals are strongly interconnected and all our interventions deliver on many goals at the same time. This means, hopefully, better and more sustainable results. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, let me stress again that the EU and its member states, as the world leading provider of uh, official development assistance, will continue to play a leading role in collaboration with the UN agencies, civil society, and other development partners to deliver poverty eradication, close inequality gaps, and bring sustainable development to the Asia and Pacific region. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Bussini, for your, for your statement. We, as government member states, recognize the important engagement and contribution from the EU uh, in our region to our region. Thank you very much for your statement. Merci infiniment for good uh, remarks. I right now to next speaker to invite uh, Mr. Vladimir Potapenko, uh, Deputy Secretary General from Shanghai Cooperation Organization to deliver his statement. You have the floor, sir. Уважаемый господин председатель, дамы и господа, добрый день. Прежде всего, от имени генерального старя Шанхайское гражданское сотрудничество Владимира Норова хотел бы передать всем участникам и организаторам нынешней сессии пожелание успехов и достижения плодотворных результатов. Для ШОС большая часть участвовать в работе 75-й сессии комитета. ШОС привержена работе в рамках раскаты ООН по повышению благосостояния и уровня жизни людей и содействию инклюзивному росту всех. Неравенство является одной из проблем, усложняющих реализацию повестки дня в области устойчивого развития. На саммите Циндау в июне 2018 года главы государств подчеркнули важность углубления регионального экономического сотрудничества в целях обеспечения их устойчивого социально-экономического развития, в том числе использования потенциала ИСКАТа ООН в ключевых сферах своей деятельности в транспорте, энергетике, торговле и информационных технологиях. Главы государств отметили также имеющийся, отметили потенциал имеющихся в международных, региональных и национальных проектах стратегии в развитии для стимулирования сотрудничества в интересах экономического развития на основе принципа уважения, равенства и взаимной выгоды. Главы правительств в октябре Душамбе 2018 года подтвердили приверженность центральной роли Организации Объединенных Наций в содействии реализации повестки дня устойчивого развития на период до 2030 года. Они призвали развитые страны оказывать финансовую и техническую поддержку развивающимся странам в соответствии с принятыми ими ранее обязательствами и оказывать им помощь в создании потенциала. После подключения Индии и Пакистана к деятельности ШОС в качестве полноправных членов значительно расширилась по возможности экономического развития 
что, что можно рассматривать как важный шаг в решении социально-экономических вопросов. Экономическое сотрудничество ШОС опирается на систему многосторонних механизмов, которые охватывают транспорт, таможню, торговлю, инвестиции, сельское хозяйство, борьбу с чрезвычайными ситуациями и стихийными бедствиями. Важнейшим направлением сотрудничества ШОС СКТ является транспортный сектор. В этом контексте ШОС продолжает реализовывать соглашение по автомобильному транспорту, которое было разработано при содействии СКТ ООН. Хотел бы подчеркнуть, что ряд стран региона проявляет живой интерес к, такой, к этому соглашению, так как оно открыто для присоединения. К примеру, Республика Беларусь в этом, году, в этом году присоединилась к этому соглашению. ШОС исходит из убежденности в том, что синергический эффект расширения сотрудничества по широкому кругу направлений между СКТ ООН, международными и региональными структурами будет способствовать расширению возможностей людей для достижения более инклюзивного роста на устойчивой основе. В заключение, позвольте мне выразить глубокую признательность исполнительному секретарю ИСКАТ ООН и ее превосходительству Армиде Аристархане за предоставленную жесткую возможность изложить свои взгляды на этой важной площадке. Подтверждаем на ремень или шос и далее углублять и расширять сотрудничество с ИСКАТ ООН. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary General of uh, SCO for your statement. Of course, we are here to support each other. Thank you for, for your statement. I'd like to invite all of you to join me to thank all our speakers. Since uh, Mr. The, Brother Mi is the last speak, was the last speaker. So thank you very much for all the speakers <laughs> for the whole morning. Now I'd like to uh, invite Uh, Mr. Renzo Santusi, Deputy Secretary General of the Commission of SCAP, to, uh, to speak to you on a few issues. Thank you very much. He's right at the floor. I finished my job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to all delegates. Uh, just a few housekeeping announcements from the Secretariat. Uh, first of all, in terms of the documentation for this session, uh, I would like to inform all delegates that the Secretariat has received the final clean version of the supplementary information on the program plan and performance uh, information as reviewed by the program planning and budget division in UN headquarters in New York, and in this regard has updated the supplementary document. The revised information document SCAP slash inf slash two slash rev two has been uploaded to the commission website Please note that the document should be viewed in conjunction with SCAP slash 75 slash 26, which is the proposed program plan for 2020, to be discussed under agenda item 6A tomorrow, 29 of May. Uh, in terms of uh, evaluations, as part of our continued efforts to improve the Commission session, we invite all delegations to respond uh, to a quick survey for each uh, uh, session. The survey should, be, should take no longer than a couple of minutes. And the Secretary has circulated an information sheet on your desk providing the access QR codes and the link to the quick surveys. Uh, the, Q, the QR codes are also available on the touch screens outside the meeting room and throughout the conference uh, center. In terms of side events, uh, I'm very pleased to remind you that this year we have um, a number of side events organized by, by countries and partners. And uh, we saw the first offering of these uh, wonderful events yesterday already. And today we have more in store for all of you. The first side event today is uh, gender equality and women's empowerment and the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal 5 in Asia and the Pacific, organized by the government of Mongolia, starting at 1 p.m. in meeting room H on level one of this uh, UN conference center. The second event is uh, entitled Solar Investment, International Solar Alliance, the Trillion Dollar Opportunity, organized jointly by the governments of France and India, the International Solar Alliance and the ESCAP Secretariat, which will also start at 1 p.m. in the public foyer on the ground floor. The third side event today is organized by the government of Bangladesh, entitled Bangladesh's Experience in Achieving the Millennium Development Goals and Actions Towards Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals which also will start at 1 p.m. in conference room four on level one of the UNCC. The fourth event today is entitled Expanding Internet Access, 
for Inclusive Development. It has been organized jointly by the governments of Thailand, the ESCAP Secretariat, and Google. The event will also start at 1 p.m. in conference room one on this floor of the conference center. Information about these events is available also in the delegation pigeon halls, uh, which are placed next to conference room one on this same level. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in terms of lunch arrangements, uh, may I also remind uh, all delegates that in addition to our regular catering uh, services on level one, we have a number of OTOP vendors offering um, mouth-watering authentic Thai food on the uh, ground floor near the garden area. So we do invite you to try also these uh, local delicacies uh, from, from the vendors and their offerings. Um, lastly, um, I'm also pleased to remind you that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Royal Thai Government will be kindly hosting a reception for all the participants of the Commission this evening and transportation will be arranged uh, for participants between the UN Conference Center and uh, the Ministry. Uh, buses will leave at 6 p.m., 18 hours, uh, from in front of the United Nations Conference Center on the ground floor. That's all for today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, um, Secretary of the Commission, for your uh, useful information. And I would like to declare our meeting uh, concluded. And we meet again at 2. Thank you for your uh, attention for the whole morning. Thank you. Tutto bene? Come, come l'è sembrato? Ieri, oggi. Ascolta dove la sinistra.
าที่ครับโอเคค่ะ